Throughout this course, we looked at many different interesting topics, but the one that stood out to me was momentum. Momentum, or P, can be described as, a, as the quantity of motion possessed by a moving object. We can calculate momentum by multiplying the mass of this object by the velocity that it is traveling at. Because we're multiplying mass, which is measured in kilograms, and velocity, which is measured in meters per second, the units for an object's momentum will be kilograms times meters per second. Let's consider a rock traveling at 15 meters per second with a mass of 25 kilograms. By using this equation here, we can calculate that the momentum possessed by this rock is equal to 25 times 15, or 375 kilograms times meters per second. Because it's a positive relationship between mass and velocity, when you increase one or the other, the momentum will also increase. Vice versa is also true. When you decrease one, momentum will decrease. Let's take a look at two scenarios of the same rock where, where this happens. We have one scenario with less mass. The, the speed stays the same, 15 meters per second, but the mass is greatly decreased, decreased to five kilograms, leaving us with a momentum of 75 much less than our original momentum of 375. When we look at a stationary rock, the mass is the same, but our speed is greatly decreased, decreased to zero, in fact. When we look back at the definition of our momentum, we can see that it has to be a moving object to have momentum. If we have no motion, we also have no momentum. If this was, were to be reduced to a small number, such as one meter per second, we would end up with one kilogram times meters per second. Again, greatly decreased from our original answer of 375 kilograms per second. One area where, mo where momentum plays a large role would be in collisions. The law of conservation of momentum states that the momentum of a system before a collision is equal to the momentum of that system after the collision. Let's look into the collision between two cars to better understand this. This collision will be inelastic, meaning they stay together after the collision. We'll give car one a, moment, a mass of 20 kilograms, and car two a mass of 10 kilograms. Car one will be traveling at a speed of five meters per second, where car two will be traveling at a speed, will be stationary. As expressed by the, our previous equation, P equals MV, we can calculate the momentum of both cars. The momentum of car one will be 20 kilograms times five meters per second, giving us a momentum of 100 kilograms meters per second. Kilogram meters per second. Because car two has no motion, no velocity, we can say and by using the equation, we can say that car two has a momentum of zero. 
10 kilograms times zero meters per second, giving us zero kilograms times meters per second. With car one having a, a momentum of 100, and car two having no momentum, or a momentum of zero, when we add them together, we have a total map momentum of the system of 100 kilograms meter per second. All right. As expressed before, now let's take a look at after the collision. We know that the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. So the momentum for this system is still 100 meters per second. We also know that it is an elastic collision. So car one and car two are bound together and traveling at the same velocity. Let's calculate this velocity. The mass of our new object with them bound together will be equivalent to the mass of car one plus the mass of car two. 20 plus 10 gives us 30. Using our equation and rearranging it to solve for our velocity, P equals mass times velocity. Velocity equals P over mass. We can solve for the final velocity of this system of the two cars. 100 divided by 30 gives us 3.33, repeating, meter, meters per second. All right. By analyzing this, we can show that to keep the same momentum, we can, to keep the same momentum with a greater mass, it is imperative that the velocity is decreased. Vice versa, in another hypothetical situation, if we would like to keep the same, same momentum with a lighter mass, we must have a higher speed. 5 versus 3.33. To slow down the car, a force is needed to, to be applied to fight against its velocity. This force can be applied in one of two ways. One, we can have a low moderate force applied over a large amount of time, for example, braking, or a very high force applied in a short span of time, for example, a car crashing. The the relationship between the time and the force being applied can be referred to as impulse. Impulse I is equal to the magnitude of the force being applied times the time that this force is being applied over. Because this is derived from, der from an integral, calculating this will give us the area under a force time graph. When a car hits a wall, it exerts a force on that wall, which in turn exerts a force back onto the car, which will slow it down from a value for velocity to zero. As we've previously stated, when the velocity is zero, is changed to zero, so is the momentum. From that, we can, we can develop the impulse momentum theory, which states that the impulse on a car is equal to the change in its momentum, or the force times the time that the force is being applied for by is equal to the mass times velocity final minus velocity initial. For someone to survive a car crash, we need a lower force acting on the car and in turn them, meaning that we need, we need a higher time because, as we know, 
it is a positive relationship between force and time and impulse. For this to happen, the automotive industry has developed cars with softer bumpers which collapse and absorb impact, increasing the time that this force is being applied. As we develop, develop a better understanding of impulse and a better understanding of materials, we can develop safer cars which take a lot longer time to crumple up, saving the people inside. Impulse can also be seen in other applications, such as airplanes. When they land, we need a greater impulse or shock absorption in those wheels for the airplane to land smoothly. Or a space shuttle docking on a space station. We need the greatest time and the least amount of force so that we do not knock it off its orbit.